Well, thank you for joining us for uh, Study 21, and today we are still in the Old Testament, as we said last week, we're concluding our study in the second book of Samuel, uh, originally one book, and uh, we're looking at this study, um, we're reading about David and God's uh, reward of faithfulness. So God bless you as you carry on with the studies today, and we'll see you next time for Study 22. God bless you. The book of 2 Samuel. Check out the video on 1 Samuel where we were introduced to the book's three main characters, Samuel, Saul, and David, and then also to the book's literary design which first introduced Samuel and then traced the rise and fall of King Saul in contrast to the rise of King David. 2 Samuel tells the story of David as Israel's king and in two movements. There's a season of success and a blessing followed by a huge moral failure and then its sad consequences. And then the book ends with this well-crafted conclusion that reflects back on the good and the bad in David's life, generating hope for a future king to come from his line. So 2 Samuel picks up after Saul's death, and David surprises everyone by composing this long poem where he laments the death of the very man who tried to murder him. And so once again, the author, he's presenting David's humility and compassion. He's a man who grieves the death even of his own enemies. After this, David experiences a season of success and God's blessing. All of the Israelite tribes, they come to David and then they ask him to unify all the tribes as their king. And so the first thing David does as king is to go to the city of Jerusalem. He conquers it and he establishes it as Israel's capital city, which he renames as Zion. And from there, David goes on and he wins many battles and expands Israel's territory. Now, after making Jerusalem the political capital of Israel, he wants to make it their religious capital as well. And so he has the Ark of the Covenant moved into the city. And then in 2 Samuel 7, he tells God, now that Israel has a permanent home, he thinks that God's presence should also get a permanent house. So he asks if he can build a temple for the God of Israel. But God says to David, thank you for that thought, but actually I'm going to build you a house, a dynasty. Now, 2 Samuel 7, this is a key chapter for understanding the storyline of the whole Bible because God here makes a promise to David that from his royal line will come a future king who's going to build God's temple here on earth and set up an eternal kingdom. And it's this messianic promise to David that gets picked up and developed more in the book of Psalms and also in the books of the prophets. And it's this king that gets connected to God's promise to Abraham, the future messianic kingdom will be how God brings his blessing to all of the nations. And it's right here in the midst of all this divine blessing that things go horribly wrong. David makes a fatal mistake, not fatal for him, but for a man named Uriah, one of David's prized soldiers. So from his rooftop, David sees Uriah's wife, Bathsheba, bathing. David finds her, he sleeps with her, gets her pregnant, and then he tries to cover the whole thing up by having Uriah assassinated and then marrying her. It's just horrible. So when David's confronted by the prophet Nathan about all of this, he immediately owns up to what he's done. He's broken, he repents, he asks God to forgive him, and God does forgive him, but God doesn't erase the consequences of David's decisions. And so as a result of this horrible choice, David's family, his kingdom, it all falls apart. And it makes this section a tragic story, much like Saul's downfall. So David's sons end up repeating his own mistakes, but in even more tragic ways. So Amnon sexually abuses his sister Tamar, and then their brother Absalom finds out about all of this and has Amnon assassinated. And then Absalom goes and he hatches the secret plan to oust his father David from power, and he launches this full-scale rebellion. And so for a second time, David is forced to flee from his own home and go hide in the wilderness, except this time he is not an innocent man. The rebellion ends when David's son is murdered, when it breaks David's heart. And so once again, he laments over the very man who tried to kill him. David's last days find him back on his throne, but as a broken man, he's wounded by the sad consequences of his sin. The book concludes with a well-crafted epilogue with stories that are out of chronological order, but they have this really cool symmetrical literary design. So the outer pair of stories come from earlier in David's reign, and they compare the failures of Saul and then of David and how each of them hurt other people through their bad decisions. 
The next inner pair of stories are about David and his band of mighty men who went about fighting the Philistines. And what's interesting is that both sections have a story of David's weakness in battle. So in contrast to the victorious David of chapters 1 through 9, here we see a vulnerable David who's dependent on others for help. The center of the epilogue has two poems that act like memoirs, and David reflects back on his life, and he remembers times when God graciously rescued him from danger. And he sees these as moments where God was faithful to his covenant promise to him and to his family. Both poems conclude by looking back onto the hope of God's promise of a future king who will build that eternal kingdom. Now these poems and then God's promise also connect back to Hannah's poem that opened the book. And so these key passages from the beginning, now the middle, and the end of the book bring the book's themes all together. Despite Saul and David's evil, God remained at work moving forward his redemptive purposes. And God opposed David and Saul's arrogance, but he exalted David when he humbled himself. And so the future hope of this book reaches far beyond David himself. It looks to the future, to the messianic king who will one day bring God's kingdom and blessing to all of the nations. And that's what the book of Samuel is all about. There was one picture I didn't show you in the last talk, or didn't talk about, so I'll just mention it now. Uh, when Samuel died, he was buried at Ramah, and his, uh, there's a kind of mosque sort of building being erected over his grave, and it's still there, you can see it. But there are two buildings, identical, each with a little minaret tower. One is a little further up the hill, and we were going up in the bus to Jerusalem, and the Israeli guide pointed not to this building, but to the other one, and said, that's the tomb of Samuel. And I said, excuse me, but I'm afraid it isn't. It's the other building that's the tomb of Samuel. And he said, have you never heard of one and two Samuel? (laughs) (laughs) Anyway. Well, I've tried to give you a kind of overview of the story, and I'm sure if you've read through it, you're familiar with it all, but at least you're seeing the pattern of it. David's pattern particularly, into the court and out of it, up to the top of it and down to the bottom. It's a very sad tale and the whole nation never actually recovered. And in fact there was a north and south tension which just held together during the reign of Solomon but when Solomon died, civil war split the nation in two. And that tension started after David's downfall. In fact, the worst thing he did was to proudly count how many people he was worth. That's when Satan tempted him. Satan had nothing to do with the Bathsheba incident. Satan wasn't needed. David thought that all up on his own. But years later, Satan tempted David. He said, you're a big man, aren't you? How many people do you reign over? And David counted them. There's nothing wrong with counting God's people. It depends why you count them. I mean, the book of Numbers counted them, but David was counting them for pride, not for military purposes or anything else. He just wanted to know how big he was. And I'm afraid that was almost the end. It brought a plague to Israel, and uh, that plague was only stopped when uh, David really cried out to the Lord. One thing David did, I should have shown you this too. Let's see if I can find it. David had returned the Ark of the Lord to Jerusalem. Here's uh, an imaginary picture really. An artist has just drawn, here's the city of David and here's the great procession when David danced before the Ark. His wife Michelle didn't like that a bit. And from that day she had no children. But uh, he brought the Ark up into the city. But above the city was this flat area very high, which was a threshing floor belonging to a man called Aruna. And uh, this threshing floor, very exposed so the wind could separate the wheat from the chaff, David saw it as an ideal place to build a temple for God. And uh, the man who, to whom it belonged said, I'll give it to you free if it's for a temple. And David said, no, I won't offer to the Lord that which has cost me nothing. And he bought it and that later became the site of the temple 
above the city. David was not allowed to build the temple because God said, you've got blood on your hands. It's got to be built by a man of peace because the name Jerusalem means city of peace. Salem is shalom, it's the same word. And therefore he said, it's got to be a man of peace. Your son will build it. And David got the plans pulled together and he got the workmen ready and he got the materials collected. The cedar of Lebanon, wood from Lebanon, and he got stone and got it all ready. But it was his son Solomon who built the temple up the top. Well now, that's what ends the book of Samuel. David's buying that threshing floor. But the whole thing is sliding downhill now. Now I want to spend this talk asking this question. When you read all these stories, what do you do with them? Are they just stories? At what level are we supposed to read them? Why do we read them? What's the point of reading them? It's ancient history. It's over and done with. Well, I want to show you that there are in fact six different levels at which you can read Bible stories. And it's important that you choose the right one. But there are six different ways that I've discovered in books. Six different ways of reading stories like the stories of David. The first I've called anecdotal. Just reading it because it's an interesting story. Especially there are stories for children. And there are some stories you wouldn't teach children. But you might teach adults. They're interesting stories. And Hollywood has made a lot of films about these stories because they've got romance and military action. They're quite sensational stories, some of them. And so Hollywood makes films purely because they're stories. And I suspect that in some Sunday schools the children are told them just because they're stories out of the Bible that are interesting. We used to sing a hymn when we were young, God has given us a book full of stories which was made for his people of old. It begins with the tale of a garden and ends with the city of gold. There are stories for parents and children, for the old who are ready to rest, but for all who can read them or listen, the story of Jesus is best. Anybody else know that song? <laughs> Written by a lady called Maria Matilda Penstone. Well, these stories are superbly told, they really are. With an economy of words and with a beautiful style, they really make interesting reading. But is that the only point of reading them? That you like a story? No. Let's move on. There are some who read these stories devotionally, looking for a personal message for themselves in it. That's a favourite way of reading the Bible. I, I'm tempted to call it the horoscope method. You read it each day hoping that something might sort of leap out and fit you. Do you know what I mean? Many people read the Bible like that. And occasionally it works. But frankly, most of the uh, verses will mean nothing to you if that's what you're looking for. If you only read a Bible, the Bible to find a word that fits you in your situation, it's very hitty-missy. Mind you, we had a young man at Millmead who fell in love with a girl called Mary. And he read his Bible and he said, fear not to take Mary as your wife. Now you'd be amazed how often Christians <laughs> act on things like that and I dare not mention the classic case because the poor man was here last time when I mentioned it so <laughs> I've got very wary. But you know the person who sort of went, Judas went out and hanged himself. Oh, that's not guidance. <laughs> Go and do thou likewise. <laughs> no. See, well, we've got to look at a text in its context. For example, if you're reading the Bible for a personal message, what do you make of this verse in 1 Samuel? In your family line there will never be an old man. That speak to you? Well, it was said to Eli by Samuel. And Jeremiah was of the line of Eli. That's why Jeremiah had to start his prophecy ministry when he was 17. Because he knew that he wouldn't live to old age. The curse went on down through the family. Or here's a word that might speak to you. Do whatever your hand finds to do, for God is with you. But then you read the next day and you read, and Samuel hacked Agag to pieces before the Lord at Gilgal. You say, well, is that a word for me? And who's the Agag in my life? Do you see what I mean? Frankly, I'm, 
I'm ridiculing this method, and I know God sometimes speaks through a verse to you, but that is not the main reason for reading these stories. That's not treating the Bible as it should be treated. It's treating it as a box full of texts, whereas it isn't that. You know, the tragedy of fitting chapter and verse numbers into Scripture has turned us all into text people instead of context people. You'll get very little out of the Bible if that's all you're doing it for, even if God sometimes gives you a word for you out of what you read. Let's look at a third method. This is a very common preacher method of treating books like Samuel, and that is to do character studies. One of the great uh, features of the Bible is its honesty. It tells you about people's good gifts and their bad weaknesses. It looks at their failures and their successes, their virtues and their vices, their strengths and their weaknesses. And it's very helpful to study a character in Scripture because James says in the New Testament that the Bible's like a mirror and you see yourself in it and you learn by looking at these people. It's wonderful really that the Bible always tells you what's wrong with people as well as what's right with them. There's only one exception, there's only one man in the entire Bible apart from Jesus who is presented to us without a fault. I wonder if you know who it is. No? Joseph. And if you study Joseph's life you'll find a perfect parallel to Jesus' life wrongly accused, coming all the way down and then rising to be saviour of his people and lord of all Egypt. It's a remarkable type as we say, but Joseph is the only person in the Old Testament of whom there is not a single fault mentioned. Well, you could look at the character of Saul, started with great personal advantages, good looks, height, and the spirit of the Lord came upon him and he was turned into another man. He'd got everything going for him. But the fatal flaw in his character was he was insecure when he was with other successful people. That's a very common weakness. Bad relationships with others and at the last he got a, an evil spirit instead of the Holy Spirit. Or you could study the character of David and the key is the word heart. David was a heart man, Saul was a head and shoulders man but David was a heart man. And you study how often the heart comes into it because God wants people's heart. The Lord doesn't look at the outward appearance, he looks on the heart and he saw a good heart in David and if you study his character, it's a wonderful study. This man of outdoor life, manual labour, skilled in music, very brave, killed a lion and a bear, but for years he only had God to talk to or to sing to and all those years were preparation for him to become the most important person in the land. But the thing I've noticed, I've underlined it in my Bible, is how many times David inquired of the Lord. Any decision, any crisis, he inquired of the Lord. And that's what the Lord appreciated. David's heart was with the Lord. And he didn't make quick decisions himself. He inquired of the Lord, he wanted to do it God's way. And in spite of his failures, that's what God loved. He was a magnanimous man, even in victory. He was unhappy when his enemies were killed. In fact, he, he could be furious because one of Saul's surviving sons was killed, even though Saul had been his enemy. He was a very magnanimous heart, very forgiving man, but a man who could honour brave people. And you find in the book of Samuel again and again a list of those whom David honoured, especially his three bravest men who when David was outlaw, David rather foolishly said, oh I, I wish I could have a drink of the water from the well at Bethlehem, such lovely water. It was just a nostalgic expression and three of his bravest men heard that and they went through enemy lines and they got to Bethlehem at night and they got a flask of water and they brought it back. They said, here's water from Bethlehem. <coughs> David poured it out for God on the ground. He said, I can't drink it. That could have cost you your lives. And he gave it to God instead. But he honoured those men. David had his honours list. 
And uh, the book finishes with a list of his brave friends whom David thought the world of. Just the opposite of Saul. He had a heart for God and he loved honoring other people. Saul didn't have a heart for God and he didn't like anybody else succeeding anywhere near him. Interesting contrast, isn't it? Though they both started well and finished badly. Or else you could make a study of the character of women in Samuel. Hannah, it's a lovely study. When God told her she was going to have a son, she praised God in words that centuries later, a 15-year-old wife called Miriam, or we call her Mary, would use in a song we call the Magnificat, which is sung all over the world today. But Mary got that song from Hannah. Did you ever notice? Read 1 Samuel 1. And, or study Abigail. Now, Abigail is a real study. You women study Abigail. David came to her father's house and demanded food for his troops. And the father of Abigail said, who does this David think he is? Instead of recognizing him as God's choice of king. And David was furious. He was going to kill the man. And Abigail, his daughter, came out, and my, she knew how to handle men. If you ladies want to know how to handle a man, read the story of Abigail. Her arguments are brilliant. No man could resist them. And uh, she persuaded David that her father was a fool and that he mustn't be too upset or taken too seriously. And she saved his father's life. Actually, he died of a heart attack shortly afterwards. But uh, David was so impressed with Abigail's way with him that he married her. And uh, these character studies are well worth doing, both for the individual aspects and for their social aspects. And it's a good way to read them, but it's not the way that the Bible was meant to be read yet. Useful, but not the way. A fourth way is to study the history. Of Israel and how it developed from a family to a tribe to a nation to an empire and we learn a tremendous lot you know politicians should study David uh, a friend of mine called Tom Houston has written a book on David for politicians today it is a brilliant book of learning how David developed leadership and cooperation how he handled government and it's an astonishing study for politicians today of the leadership. We've already said that the leadership changed in Israel's history from patriarchs to prophets, now to princes. And this brought them higher up their goal towards the total promised land. And it's a fascinating study. From the days at the end of the book of Judges where it says, in those days Israel had no king and everyone did what he thought was right in his own eyes. Well, they got a king, but I'm afraid still things didn't go well. So it's worth studying the leadership question. And it's worth studying the structure, how they changed from having a, a federal relationship between 12 independent tribes to centralized government and what that does, relevant precisely now to Europe. And you can study the differences between a federal relationship between tribes and a centralized government. And the lesson is that the more centralized the government, the more the character of that government determines the fate of the nation. See? That's worth studying from that point of view. David's genius as an organizer comes out. They reach the peak of peace and prosperity under centralized government. But centralized government was going to be their downfall as well. And the moral is that when the power is in fewer and fewer hands, the character of those, the people with those hands is going to determine what happens. Boy, you see, these are relevant lessons, aren't they? But it's still not the way it was meant to be read. Then there's one way that the scholars have, and this is one of the worst ways of reading the Bible. We call it the critical way. And it started in Germany. When I was in Germany, I preached... Uh, in a huge church in Berlin, in the pulpit where there'd been a famous preacher called Martin Niermuller, who had been a U-boat captain in the First World War, but 
defied Hitler in the second and was in Dachau concentration camp. But from that pulpit, I said to the German people, when are you going to repent of the damage you've done to the whole world? And they thought I was going to talk about two world wars, but I wasn't. They thought I was going to talk about the Jewish Holocaust, but I wasn't. I said, you know the damage that Germany's done more than anything else to the entire world? Higher criticism, which has so infected the theological college of the world that there are young men who go to college to train for the ministry and they come out without any faith because the Bible has been torn to bits by critical scholarship and people have been taught to read the Bible with a pair of scissors and cut it up into bits and throw some bits away. That's what I mean by critical. But there are two levels of critical study which is looking for possible errors in the Bible. And the lower criticism is all right. It's the higher criticism that's all wrong. These are probably terms you haven't heard. But I'll explain them very simply because they've done so much damage that I call theological seminaries, theological cemeteries. They have literally killed the faith of so many. Lower criticism wants to see if there are any errors in the text because we don't have the original copies. We've only got copies of copies. And of course the question is, have mistakes been made in the copying? Now I'm behind this wholeheartedly. Scholars have worked very hard to get back to the original text to make sure we've got the Bible accurately. And it is true to say that now we've got the New Testament 98% accurate. Old Testament's a bit behind that, but you'll realize that after hundreds of years, mistakes are made in copying. But, for example, when the Dead Sea Scrolls were discovered in 1948 by that Bedouin shepherd boy throwing stones into the cave, we discovered a complete copy of Isaiah which was 1,000 years older than all the copies we had up till then. Up till then, the Old Testament was, bit, was translated from copies of the Old Testament which were dated 900 AD. But the Dead Sea Scrolls were dated 100 BC. And so our knowledge of Isaiah was in one swoop taken back a thousand years and word went to America where the Revised Standard Version of Isaiah was just being translated, hold everything. We've got a copy that's a thousand years earlier. But when they checked it out, they said to the Americans, you can go ahead. It's been so well preserved over a thousand years that only a few things will need to be changed. Interesting. Now, lower criticism seeks to get back to the original text, and I'm all for that. The more accurate we've got the Bible, the better, right? But it's higher criticism that does the damage. Higher criticism says that even when you get the original text, people could still be mistaken. And it's higher criticism that does the damage. And scholars who approach it this way do it with their own subjective premises or presuppositions and many of them come to the Bible and say, well, the miraculous is impossible. Science has proved that miracles don't happen. So when they get to a miracle in the Bible, they say that must be a mistake. They cut it out. Got the picture? And it's that higher criticism that has destroyed people's faith in the Bible. And that is a deadly way of studying the Bible. It's all right trying to get the original text so that we have no mistakes in what's written. As for example, in, uh, even in the books we're studying, at one point it says that Saul began to reign when he was one year old. That is clearly a mistake. Because another text says he began to reign when he was 30. Well, they can't both be right. There's been a mistake somewhere. And we need to get back as far as we can to the original and find out which was right. But that's the kind of lower criticism to get the text right. It's an entirely different matter to say, ah, but were they mistaken when the whale swallowed Jonah? Is that an error? One thing to say, have we got the text as Jonah gave it to us? But it's another to say, but do we accept what is said then? if it doesn't fit in with modern scientific notions. So that's the critical way and that's, scholars spend a lot of time and in Germany many 
biblical scholars never go, even go to church. They do it purely as an academic intellectual exercise. And uh, that's become a very common way of treating these stories, cutting them in bits and saying which do you accept and which do you not. The real way to read these books of narrative is what we call the theological way. Don't be put off by that word. Theology is simply what you think about God. That's all. Everybody's a theologian because everybody's got ideas about God. And you really need to read these narratives to find out what you can about God. He is the real actor in these stories. Not Saul, not David, not Samuel. Behind them all, God is in there and he is having an influence on history. He's uh, intervening at crucial points. He sends Samuel to anoint David. He deals with Saul. He deals with David. It is the story of God. This is, as I said, prophetic history and it's about God. And we need to ask the question, what is God doing in all this? How is he relating to his people? How is the covenant working out? And that's why you read the whole story because you're looking for how God intervenes in history. See, God is the living God. Many years ago, a, a philosopher called Nietzsche said God is dead. He was a German and he was the philosopher behind Hitler actually. And he taught that God was dead. He did not mean that God had ceased to exist. What he meant was, God is no longer active in this world. Because when someone's dead, they are no longer active in this world. It doesn't mean they've ceased to exist. It means they're not active here. We can't hear what they say, we can't see what they do. And Nietzsche said God is dead, but I heard a story of a German university where there was, this was put up in large letters, God is dead, Nietzsche, and a student had written underneath, Nietzsche is dead, God, <laughs> uh, which was a suitable rejoinder. But you see, many people do believe God is dead, not meaning he ceased to exist, but that he's no longer active in our world. He's not the living God. But you see, throughout these books, God is the living God. It was one of David's favorite titles for God. He's the living God. Meaning he's speaking and doing things in our world. And the reason for re reading all these stories is to find out how God behaves in our world what is important to him and how he reacts to the way people behave. This is why we read these stories. God both initiates historical events and responds to them and reacts to them. We learn about his character. You may study the character of Saul and the character of David and Hannah and Abigail profitably, but the real reason to read all this is you're studying the character of God. You're studying not just his thoughts, but his feelings. God has feelings too. And you find these come out. What makes God angry? What makes him sad? What makes him happy? Well, you learn about all this. The only reason really to read the Bible is to get to know God. Get to know what he's like, how he ticks, how he feels about you. Because he'll feel about you the same way he felt about these people. Because he hasn't changed nor has human nature changed for that matter. We find that God has given them the land, but now they are disobeying him, he's angry. But he's very patient. He, he always waits an awful long time before he punishes someone. Have you noticed that? He is slow to anger. Thank God he is. Because if he was quick to anger, you wouldn't have a teacher here this afternoon. I'll tell you, there'd be nobody sitting down there either. <laughs> See, thank God he's slow to anger. People are impatient with God. The American preacher in Boston, Phillips Brooks, used to say the trouble is I'm in a hurry and God isn't. Well, thank God he isn't. We want him to get rid of all the evil people in the world by next Thursday. God, why don't you get rid of all the bad people and then the rest of us could enjoy life? There's an assumption in that which is almost amusing. But I hear it from people, don't you? Why doesn't God deal with all these dreadful people as if they're not dreadful, you know? As if they would be still surviving if God destroyed all the bad people. But no, if God destroyed all the bad people quickly, there'd be nobody left. Thank God he's slow to anger, but that doesn't mean he won't be angry. It doesn't mean his anger won't boil over. There comes a time when God's had enough.
when his patience runs out. Woe betide us if we're around when that happens. He'd given them the land, he'd given them a king, the first one, the kind they wanted. When that failed, he gave them his choice. He'd done so much for them, but giving them a king meant, and this introduces us to the next study when we look at the book of Kings, in giving them a king, it meant that the character of the king would be the crucial factor in the fortunes of the whole people. A bad king would corrupt the whole nation. A good king would lead them in the right way. And we know it from our own monarchy right now. That's the whole disturbance that there is. We want a good king or a good queen, knowing that the influence on that, of that on the nation will be good. When you're, if you're going to have royalty, terrific responsibility put on them to lead us right and to be an example that people will follow. But if they're not, you might as well not have a monarchy at all. It's going to lead us astray and that's precisely the debate that's going on right now. Interesting that uh, the new Prime Minister of Australia, who is not such a Republican as Paul Keating was, he has taken an oath of loyalty this week to our Queen, but he cut out of the oath of loyalty one phrase, loyalty to the Queen, her heirs and successors, and he wouldn't say that. He would take an act of loyalty to the Queen, but not to the heirs and successors. That is the danger of having a monarchy. There are so many good things but it also means that they have an influence far out of proportion. In a federal republic, that doesn't happen. And they changed. Saul, David and Solomon each ranged, reigned for 40 years, but David's peak was followed by a fall and it was God who did it. He left a legacy to Solomon of many wives, and he left a legacy of a nation that was divided between north and south. Great tension between the tribes in the north and the south because Jerusalem was in the south and the money was spent in the south and somehow the south was more prosperous than the north. Does that strike <laughs> familiarity? Well, there it is. Now above all, before I finish this, I must tell you that God made a special covenant with David. For the first time since he made a covenant with Abraham and Moses, God made another covenant with David. And this is the most crucial and vital thing in 1 and 2 Samuel. It arose when David wanted to build a house for God. He was embarrassed that he'd built such a palace for himself and that God was living in a tent next door. You can understand the embarrassment. And so David said, God, I'm going to build you an even better house than I've got. And there were three messages from the prophet Nathan over this. The first message was, do it. Second message was, don't do it. God had a, a second thought about it. And his second thought was very interesting. God says, a tent is good enough for me. Since when did I ask for a palace of stone? Isn't that interesting? Why do you want me to build me a house? I've always lived in this tent. I didn't want anything more. It's a little dig at David. <laughs> you built yourself a big palace. <laughs> you sure you needed it? That was the second. The third was, I won't let you build it because you're a man of blood, but your son can, a man of peace. Solomon actually never fought a battle. He inherited from his father David a situation of peace. And then comes the covenant. God says, David, I'll treat your son as my son. I'll flog him, but I'll never cease to love him. Interesting phrase. And then comes the great promise. Your house and your kingdom shall endure before me forever. Your throne shall be established forever. I will build a permanent house for you, David. You want to build one for me. I will build a house for you, but it'll be a royal house. 
And one reason why from then on David's descendants always kept careful records of their family tree was that they were waiting for a son of David. Indeed, for centuries before Jesus was born, when a boy was born, the father rushed out into the street and shouted, Dawiz, Dawiz, it's a boy, it's a boy, but he gave him the name David. And uh, on our 25th wedding anniversary, my wife gave me a ring. I watched it being made by a little Jew in a back street in Jerusalem. It's got the wall of Jerusalem on it. And on the top of the ring, three Hebrew letters, Dawiz. They didn't have vowels. And she gave that to remind me to be a watchman on the wall. But Dawiz. That's how they announced a boy's birth. Dawiz. It's a boy. And it might be David. And for hundreds of years they did that. A thousand years later this covenant was fulfilled and the promise was kept. And Jesus was born of a humble couple but who'd kept their family tree. And interestingly enough both Joseph and Mary were de descended directly from King David. And so legally Jesus was the son of David through Joseph his father because le legally you were the heir of your father but physically he was the son of David through his mother. So he was twice over the son of David and all through his life he was called that. Very interesting how often he's called son of David. When he rode in on the donkey, Hosanna, son of David. And many people called him that. Is not this the son of David? Comes of the seed of David. He was born and he died under the title king of the Jews and he still reigned not just over Israel but over all nations. All authority in heaven and on earth is given to this son of David and always will be in his hands. God has kept that covenant with David in his son Jesus. Isn't that exciting? When God makes a promise, he keeps it. He never lies. And he made that covenant with David that a son of his would sit on the throne forever. Jesus He's king of the Jews. He was born and died king of the Jews. He's king of the church. He's our king and he should be ruling the church. So often he seems to cry to us, give me back my church. But one day he's king of the world. He's coming back to reign in Jerusalem as the son of David. The last question the disciples asked Jesus when he ascended to heaven was, are you going to restore the kingdom to Israel at this time? And he didn't say that's a silly question. He said it's not for you to know the date that Father has fixed. Which means it is going to happen. And one day Jesus will reign on earth as King of the Jews. But he's also going to reign over the whole world. And even more exciting, we are going to reign with him. And all that is out of Samuel and the covenant God made with David and our future is tied up with that covenant. That's why we should read these books. They're interesting stories. They make good character studies but the best way to read it is to find out what God is like because he's the God that we deal with too and we are his people through the son of David, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.